Hello, I'm Ruben Palas of Brappler, here, here with Matthew, or Matthew Libetic, on his latest cinematography achievement on Bradley Cooper's Maestro. Hey, Matthew, congratulations. I have, Hi, how are you, Ruben? Yeah, I have seen Maestro about three times already, and I have came away even more impressed with your work on this, on this film each time. So let's start by talking about how this is your second collaboration with Bradley after A Star is Born. When Bradley asked you to work with him again on Maestro, what were your immediate thoughts and reactions? Well, I was elated when he asked me to make the film um, and, and just told me he wanted to work with me again. You can never take it for granted. There was, despite the success of some an experience like A Star is Born, that that was going to happen. But it did, and I was flattered and uh, immediately went to work. I mean, honestly, he, he worked so hard in prep, as hard as he worked in, in the film, he worked hard on prep, um, preceding uh, even getting a green light. We were shooting tests for hair and makeup for, uh, and prosthetics, you know, working with Kazu way ahead of the game. And, you know, we were able to test formats. We were able to test film stocks. We were able to test uh, digital cameras versus film cameras and um, lenses. So we were able to um, really sort of build the look of the movie over the course of shooting all of these tests. We, you know, we, we, we learned so much that informed us to how we were going to approach it. So, you know, I, it's a pleasure to work with him again. He's like uh, I was saying previously, he, he's, he's really evolved into a, a great filmmaker with a voice. Mm -hmm. My Esther is obviously a different film from A Star is Born. What were your specific challenges for Maestro? You know, I had to relearn black and white. I had to relearn a certain type of lighting. Um, you know, in modern day cinematography, so much of the light is LED and it's very soft. And there are things about the digital image that require us to light a certain way. Well, those same ways don't work in black and white photography, <laughs> uh, at least on film. And uh, so relearning that was a challenge for me. So, but I just did, I did as much as much uh, testing as I possibly could so that I could have a better understanding so I could feel free on set to be able to collaborate with Bradley and the actors. So um, so that was I would say that was the chief, really the chief uh, concern and anxiety I had was the is, is pulling off the black and white photography. Mm -hmm. And the crucial scene where Bradley as Leonard Bernstein, conducts Mahler's second symphony with the London Philharmonic and the choir at the L.E. Cathedral is one of the most beautiful shots I have seen in recent cinema. That scene just takes my breath away every time. How did you and Bradley plan to shoot that unforgettable scene? How did you manage to light such a huge space? Well, I, I, the way I managed to light the huge space is I actually trusted the people who I was able to get to work with me on it. I mean, the gaffer... Um, had lit spaces like that before, you know, he, he works in the UK. These buildings mean, you know, they're just, they're things he's seen before. And he had a lot of suggestions right away. And, you know, I knew I needed a certain type of light for the main area, but how I was going to pull the architecture out and the depth of the space at night was the main concern for me. Um, and I really utilized their uh, expertise to get that done. Um, in terms of the camera, you know, we, we shot, you know, we were so inspired. There was things that we had planned to do and that we shot that aren't in the film. Because um, not, I, I, I think it's it's very similar to A Star is Born at the end when you have what this one take on Ali on the stage. Well, the scene evolved into basically one camera take that sort of lands at the end of his performance over Felicia to sort of connect her into the scene. That just that evolution is just uh, uh, born out of just a need and a creativity and a willingness to try to make it better, try to make the scene better, and 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 that just sort of something just happened to him. You know, the magic isn't in the shot of that. The magic is the performance and the camera that's allowing this performance to actually happen in front of it um, and giving you that freedom, and then having the narrative point at the very end of landing over Felicia. I think is. Um, the true victory of it. That cathedral scene brings me to the achievement of Bradley as an actor and director. 
Bradley and Master just received four Golden Globe nominations. Best Picture Drama, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Actress. Can you talk about the dedication of Bradley to make this film? Um, I don't understand the question. The education of Bradley? Yeah, how do you, I mean the, the dedication, how, how dedicated he was because it's oh, dedicated, his, yeah. his passion. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was remarkable. I mean, just the effort that I saw from him day to day and shooting it. But I'd been, I was there at the very beginning when he first had the, you know, when he, I don't, I wasn't there when he first had the idea, but I was there pretty early. And the, his level of concentration and dedication to the project is, uh, is, I don't know, it's pretty legendary to me. Um, and on the set, just his efforts of getting ready with Kazu in the mornings before I arrived, you know, sometimes spending six hours in a chair, um, was, you know, it's not, to, not nothing to sneeze at. It was, it was incredible. So his dedication is like, there's no, uh, you can't dispute it. It was remarkable. And Bradley spent six years learning how to conduct in the style of uh, Leonard Bernstein. I think I read that he went to several cities to train with the, this, all these different conductors. So what was that like for you to witness on your camera, this performance of Bradley? You know, it was interesting because I was I was lucky enough to hang out with Bradley and um, uh, Gustavo Dudamel in L.A. And um, that was inspirational just because you, you're, you, you know, you're you're in the presence of a master, you know. And, and I think that, um, as I was saying earlier, was like, I, I, I love being around creative people. Creative people drive me to be, you know, better and um, and inspire me. And then it's the same thing happened with meeting do them out because I um I just felt like I was in the presence of greatness. And and Bradley just watching him just sort of soak everything in. Um but I'll be honest, I, I uh Leonard Bernstein, when you watch footage of him, his just gestures um and his name just the intensity of his movements is emotional. And I felt that through the camera, watching Bradley play Leonard Bernstein, I felt that through the camera emotionally, whether it's pure joy uh, or or sadness or whatever he was trying to convey was conveyed through these these movements. I couldn't tell you what one meant to the other from a musical standpoint. All I know is that in camera, it was emotional. I certainly saw that in the movie. And for this film, Bradley, as you mentioned, had to undergo makeup and prosthetics each morning. So how did that work out for you and him in planning the shots for the day? I mean, it just was what it was. It was what it was. He he would show up, he'd do his work, he'd get ready, and then we would just, uh, like normal director and uh, DP, start working it out at the beginning. It wasn't any different. I just felt bad for him having to be up uh, way way ahead of me, but um, like I said, he was dedicated. He was dedicated. He did what he had to do to make the film happen. You also got to shoot the terrific performance of Carrie Mulligan. What was your experience like shooting Carrie and her many characters, various emotions in the film? I was just so moved by several of her scenes in that in this film. She blew me away every day. To be quite honest, Carrie Mulligan. Uh, her performance, her her persona, the person. I don't think that the film would have the visual language that it does without her um, and what she brought to the table. She allowed the camera to be patient. She allowed uh, a scene to be patient. She has allowed for a camera to sit on on, a, on two people talking and linger and not and where you're never bored because she's. I mean, like a musician, and she's switching. She's playing notes, and it's it's such a beautiful thing to watch. So, um, I mean, I can't say enough about Carrie. I mean, I, I credit with I, mean, I I would credit with her with half the cinematography. <laughs> and how did it excite you to shoot on, on film, not on digital, and in black and white early in the film, and then in color, and to shoot at different periods? Well, I mean, shooting periods is always fun. You know, what can I say? It's a, it's always like a pleasure to go back. You know, my goal wasn't to make the film look like an old movie, um, although there are a few shots that sort of feel that way in the film. 
I my goal wasn't to to to, to study old films and then emulate them. I, what I was trying to do is create a reality and a naturalism within a world that we hadn't seen in a long time. So you know, looking at pho- photography of uh, Elliot Erwitt and Roy Bakarava and some of the heroes of mine. Um, just pouring over some old references and just sort of getting in tune. And there was this amazing book by uh, John Bruin called The Life and Times of Leonard Bernstein, where he interviewed and photographed the family during a vacation in Italy. There's so many candid chops in that book that I just, uh, I kind of fell in love with the way it looked. So that's what that, I, I think, if anything, that was more of the inspiration, uh, the tactile into what I was doing in the black and white. In regards to the color, I mean, I give all the credit to uh, uh, Mark Bridges and Kevin Thompson because the palette made the color work. Um, I did some manipulations in the stock and how I rated it and how I printed it. But uh, the color, you know, the color that sings in the film is 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 put on the screen by those men. And you got to shoot in uh, Bernstein's actual summer home in Connecticut. How did that feel to be filming in Bernstein's real life summer residence? Well, when we first started working there, I was a little nervous, to be quite honest, because I know, you know, even though we say we're going to be very careful, you know, we have a lot of crew coming in, the big equipment walking in, lights and camera gear and dollies, and, you know, we had a crane. And I was just a little nervous that we were going to be, you know, stomping around this sort of sacred ground. Sacred ground. But I immediately you start to feel a warmth there. It's like this warmth of Leonard Bernstein in a sense that creativity is welcome. And um, pretty soon I got over my anxiety about, you know, bringing gear all over the place and just, uh, and, and it was able to ease in. So it was like, you could, I think you could feel a spirit there and the family spirit. And you could feel it in, in, in you know, meeting, in meeting um, Jamie and Alex. It's like you could feel it through them as well. So, uh what an extraordinary life those two had. I understand that you got to chat with Steven Spielberg, who is one of the film's producers, along with Martin's, Martin Scorsese on set. What did you get to talk about with Spielberg? And what was it like to have this his iconic energy on set? I mean, he's an inspiration. He's, a, he's an inspiration. He's an institution. He's a legendary filmmaker, and I'm having a conversation with him on set. It's like... I. You could, everybody, I, I, if I say that, you can imagine how cool that was. <laughs> so I don't know if I could even put it into word how cool it was. You know what I mean? I can't wait to watch a postcard from Earth, which you shot with your frequent collaborator, uh, Darren Aronofsky. The film is earning raves from people who have seen it at The Sphere in Las Vegas. I understand that MGM has a special new camera created for the film. Talk about that. And for those of, of us who have not seen Postcard from Earth, can you describe what the experience is like viewing the film at Sphere? Well, I mean, there's one word called uh, immersive. It's an immersive experience and, um, and somewhat experiential because the screen and the image is, um, is all around you. I mean, you have to look straight up in the air and you can look behind you and you're still surrounded by the image. It's not 360 degrees, but it might as well be because it, it encompasses your entire peripheral vision. Um, MSG created six 16K cameras all bespoke to this, uh, to this venue and the screen and this technology. So um, it's quite a feat what they did technically. And then, you know, there's some bumps down the road, technically trying to get our images onto that screen, but uh, what a learning curve! We we all of us learned so much about this, and um, I'm really really excited to see what happens with the next one. Like, what are they going to do? How are we going to evolve storytelling in this format? It's such a huge image that it, put, that it puts out that it's um, you know it's I recommend seeing it regardless. It, it, the film is great, but just the experience of being in fear is, um, you could see it when you're walking outside in Las Vegas, people just standing outside smiling. It literally makes people happy because it's just this enormous kind of wonder. And then you're inside and it's a completely different experience. So it's, uh, you know, I certainly recommend that, recommend it. I can't wait. I can't wait to go to Vegas then. And what are you work- working on next? I'm prepping a film in New York. I can't really talk about it right now, but um, 
yeah, that's the next thing. And for my last question, for my Rappler readers and your Filipino followers, and there's lots of them, how do you usually spend Noche Buena or Christmas Eve? Do you have lechon and what other Filipino dishes? I mean, I'm a, um, I usually, Christmas Eve, you know, that's usually when we open gifts because yeah. we, we always, open, when I was a kid, we used to open them at night. Um, so I still do that. But, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, I, I I right now I've been eating uh, I've been preferring to eat sinigang. I don't go I, I we don't have enough people to eat the uh, uh, the chon, but uh, I love sinigang. What kind of sinigang? Ba bangus or fish? Baboy. <laughs> baboy. No, uh, baboy. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matthew, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we can't wait to watch your next movies. Thank you so much for all this uh, granting. It's good us talking to you. Yeah, same here. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. And thank Be you guys, guys. Thank you.